Hey guys, how are you today? Hopefully you have a wonderful week like always because today I'll be continuing with my David Bowie discography journey and we've made it to a 17th studio album from 1987 called Never Let Me Down. Now Never Let Me Down is regarded as one of David Bowie's weakest albums and even David himself had dislike a big dislike for the album. David was critical of Never Let Me Down, distancing himself from the arrangement and production of the finished album. Now, there were many times that David wanted to remake the album because he disliked it that much. And finally, it happened in 2018. The new version of the album is considered an improvement over the original album. When talking about the title of the album and the album cover, David said it's a pompous little title isn't it? Seen out of context, it can be quite abrasive, but in the context of the songs on the album, I think it's rather tongue-in-cheek to use it as the title. Also, there's a vaudevillian thing about the cover. The two combined are kind of comical. David also admitted that he regrets not being more involved in the production of the album. There's also a deleted track from the album because David disliked it that much. He wanted it removed from the album called Too Dizzy. And I did find it, and I'm curious, why did David hate it so much that he wanted it removed from the album? So I will be listening to Too Dizzy as well. Now there are 11 tracks on the album, including too Dizzy. Without Too Dizzy, there would only be 10. But anyway, let's get into it with track one, Day In, Day Out. <laughs> And that was track one, day in, day out. And I, you know what? I, I enjoyed myself. I really did enjoy the overall production of the track, in particular, the guitars and the backing vocalists as well. And you could tell David had fun recording the song just from his vocals. It's definitely a wild song. And there were times during the production where it was reminded me of something. I couldn't really put my finger on it but it was reminding me of a particular album from the 80s, some sort of song. I couldn't put my finger on it, so I had to listen to the song again. And what came to mind was Ja Jackson's Control album. It has that 80s Ja Jackson R&B industrial sound to it. It even kind of reminds me of Janet's Rhythm Nation album as well. So it's like a morph of Control and Rhythm Nation, with David Bowie thrown into the mix as well. <laughs> day in and day out, stay in, fade out. She was born in a handbag, love left on a doorstep. What she lacks is a backup. Nothing seems to make a dent. Gonna find her some money, honey. Try to pay her rent. That's the kind of protection what everyone is shouted about. He also goes on to say that first thing she learns is she's a citizen. Some things, they turn out right when you're under the USA. Someone rings a bell and it's all over. She's going out of her way, stealing for that one good rush. He does seem to be singing about this girl, this young woman, who is struggling in life. 
she can't pay her rent and she doesn't have access to a lot of money. And late night big town, police shakedown. She's stealing. She's an angry gal. Shooting her with video drugs, bullets, and promises. There is something quite reckless about this song, about this girl. Obviously there's some sort of social commentary happening. It's also quite sad because it looks like she wasn't raised properly. She was born in a handbag, love left on the doorstep. So was she perhaps left on a doorstep by her parents with no money and she had to struggle throughout her entire life? She had to steal. Lyrically, the song criticizes the treatment of the homeless in the United States at that time and deals with the depths to which a young mother sinks to feed her child. Okay. I really did enjoy the song, and you know what? I would personally listen to it again. But anyway, let's move on to track two, Time Will Crawl. That was track two, Time Will Crawl, and this is another song that I enjoyed. I liked the beat of the song. The saxophone as well was bliss to listen to, and I liked the overall production of this song as well. I will say we are two tracks into the album, and I am enjoying myself so far. I know a government man, he was as blind as the moon, and he saw the sun in the night. He took a Top Gun pilot and he made him fly through a hole till he grew real old and he never came down. He just flew till he burst. Time will crawl till our mouths run dry. Time will crawl till our feet grow small. Time will crawl till our tails fall off. And then he also says, you were a talented child. You came to live in our town. We never bothered to scream when your mask went on. We only smelt the gas as we lay down to sleep. Time will crawl for the crackpot notion. So just like track one, Day In Day Out, I imagine there is social commentary happening in this track as well. This song is kind of scary in a way. He's singing about this government man who was blind and he kept flying up into the sky until he burst. Time will crawl till our tails fall off. I saw a black, black stream full of white-eyed fish and a drowning man with no eyes at all. Huh. <laughs> and the pills I took made my fingers disappear. We only smelt the gas as we lay down to sleep. I... I don't know. <laughs> David said that this track is his favorite from the album and was inspired by the events from the Chernobyl disaster. Oh, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> okay, and the idea that someone from one's own neighborhood could be responsible for the end of the world. Oh my god, where is Ziggy Stardust when you need him? David also said that the song is one of his favorites from his entire career. So even though this album was quite panned and it's still regarded as one of his weakest albums. It looks like this song was a big deal and seems to be one of the highlights from the album. This definitely isn't the happiest album to listen to. It's quite dark just with the lyrics, the stories, the context of what he's singing about. It is quite dark. Homelessness and 
what mothers have to do to feed their children, I guess, when they don't have money and they can't pay their rent. And this song, The End of the World, Chernobyl, and a little disturbing. But at the same time, I still think it's a good song, and it just like track one day in, day out. I would listen to this song again. But anyway, let's move on to track three, Beat of Your Drum. <laughs> And that was track three, Beat of Your Drum, and another song on the album that I personally enjoyed listening to. I mean, this isn't the most memorable David Bowie album ever, but I still think it's a solid effort from him. And considering this is his 17th studio album, I kind of like it. <laughs> Reckless and Tame, I like the beat of your drum, I like to look in your eyes. I like to look through your things. I like to beat on your drum. I like the smell of your flesh. I like the dirt that you dish. I like the clothes that you wear. I like to beat on your drum. I beat it, I beat it. I like to beat on your drum. I like to blow on your horn. Well. He obviously isn't very subtle in the lyrics. <laughs> he wants to blow your horn. He wants to blow on your horn. And he wants to beat on your drum. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it or I just have a dirty mind. But obviously some sort of double entendres happening there. David called the song a Lolita song. And a Lolita is a young girl who is seductive. The song is a reflection on young girls. Christ, she's only 14 years old, but jail's worth it. What? <laughs> he said that, not me. <laughs> David. <laughs> That's what R. Kelly said, and look what happened to him. I should not have gone there. Anyway, I like the song, and I am enjoying this album so far, so let's just move on to the next track. Track 4, Never Let Me Down.
that was track four, Never Let You Down. Another song I enjoyed. It's not... It's not the most memorable thing in the world, but I thought it was nice to listen to for the first time. I liked the melody of the chorus. And the harmonica, yes. <laughs> I get really excited when I listen to the harmonica. Anyway, um, the whistling too at the end, I enjoyed. I will say it does sound like a very commercial sounding 80s ballad. It sounds like a song you'd hear in an 80s teen movie like Pretty in Pink or <laughs> The Breakfast Club or something. She danced her little dads till it made me cry. She was shaken like this honey doing that. When I needed soul revival, I called her name. When I was falling to pieces, I screamed in pain. Your soothing hand that turned me round. A love so real swept over me. Never let me down. She never let me down. I did like the beat of this song, and even though I did say it's not the most memorable thing in the world when it comes to David Bowie's music, I still enjoyed it, and I... Okay. I would listen to it again, just like the other songs, so... I'm... I'm having a good time listening to this album. David described the song as a pivotal track for himself, calling it the most personal song he had written for an album to that point in his career. Wow. It's hard for two people to feel totally at ease in each other's company for that period of time and not expect too much from each other. Always be prepared to be there if the other one needs someone. It is a beautiful song, lyrically, and... I do like the lyrics on this album. I like the stories that he's sharing with us on this album, but also the feelings as well, his heart. We are four tracks into the album, and so far it's four for four. I've enjoyed the first four songs. Let's see if we can continue the momentum until track 11. But anyway, let's move on to track five, Zeros. <laughs> And that was track five, Zeros, and I think my favorite part of the song was David's vocals. I also enjoyed the production. It sounded like a live song, especially towards the middle where we hear the cheering of an audience. Tonight the Zeros were singing for you. Yeah, something good is happening. I don't know what it is. Don't you know we're back on trial again today? And then he keeps repeating, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you try to do. So I did think the song dragged on much longer than it needed to. He just keeps saying, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter where you try to go for at least a minute and a half straight. According to David, it's a nostalgia trip. I wanted to put in every 60s cliche I could think of. Stopping and preaching and letting love in, all those things. I hope there's a humorous undertone to it. I did like listening to this song for the first time, but just like a few of the other songs I've listened to already, it's not very memorable when it comes to David Bowie's standards. So even though I've enjoyed the songs so far on the album, they aren't really songs I would revisit all the time. But anyway, let's move on to track six, Glass Spider. Up until one century ago, there lived in the 
Zai Duan province, a glass like a spider. Its web was also unique in that it had many layers, like the floors of a building. When the breeze blew through this construction, it produced sounds of wailing and crying. The baby spiders would get scared and search frantically for their mother, but the glass spider would have long gone at the winter turn of the centuries. That was track six, A Glass Spider. Wow. The most intriguing song on the album so far. The spoken word at the beginning. That was reminding me of Vincent Price and Grace Jones. <laughs> he was telling this story of the glass spider. Having devoured its prey, it would drape the skeletons over its web in weeks creating a macabre shrine of remains. This is a very spooky song. <laughs> On top of this palace-like place were tiny shining objects, glass beads, dewdrops. One could almost call it an altar. When the breeze blew through this construction, it produced sounds of wailing, crying. The baby spiders would get scared and search frantically for their mother. But the glass spider, would have long gone. Mummy, come back, cause the water's all gone. But you see to who's in heaven. Is there anyone in hell? Take care. Somewhere she glows divine. So I really don't know the point of this song. <laughs> Is this glass spider supposed to represent some sort of metaphor. Perhaps these baby spiders have to fend for themselves because their mother is gone now. This glass spider. Mommy come back because it's dark now. I also enjoyed the just general progression of the song from beginning to end and the production also was quite unexpected. I thought this was a fun song on the album. A bizarre song but I'm still highly intrigued by it. The Glass Spider is a kind of mythological story based on a documentary David had seen about Black Widow spiders, describing how the spiders lay the skeletons of their prey out on their webs. David also thought that the glass spider's web would make a good enclosure for the tour. What a coincidence. I watched the movie Black Widow with my sister last night. Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson. I did enjoy this track and I would definitely listen to it again. I think this might be one of my favorite tracks from the album. So let's move on to track seven, Shining a Star, Making My Love. I'm gonna 
And now it's track seven, Shiny Star, Making My Love. And I don't know if this song is absolutely brilliant or absolutely atrocious. <laughs> at first, I didn't even know who was singing. Was that David at the beginning? His falsetto and... At first, I thought he sounded like... George Michael, and then I thought he sounded like Prince, and then Michael Jackson. <laughs> it's like he was trying to be everybody else other than himself on this track. It's almost like he was imitating other musicians. It's a very experimental song. I don't know what you guys think of it, but I didn't like it at all. It's definitely my least favorite song on the album. I'll even go as far as say that this might be one of the worst songs he's ever recorded, perhaps. I mean, what do I know? But the longer I think about it and the longer I let this song settle in my stomach, <laughs> in the pits of my stomach, um, I... There wasn't anything particularly good about it, in my opinion. Spending two weeks in a crack house, burns on his brains like Chernobyl. Dean was seen with a two-bag purchase. He was lying dead on his mother's bed. Someone to pray for. Making my love like a shining star. Taking my love just a touch too far. Tessie turns tricks with a soul like ice. Cause love left holes and four swell kids, breaking her heart. With debts in hell and fingers in blood, poor little bodies all covered in scabs, threw it all away another life in the grave. I do kind of like the lyrics, so that probably is the highlight for me. David described the song as one that reflects back to street situations and how people are trying to get together in the face of so many disasters never knowing if they're going to survive it themselves. He rejected the notion that his high little voice, which he attributed to Smokey Robinson in the song, was a new character to follow behind Ziggy Stardust or the Thin White Duke, instead saying that it was just what the song needed as he had tried the song in his regular voice and did not like the outcome. That never bothered me, changing voices to suit a song. Well, he fooled me. I mean, you could tell he was having fun with the song. It's a very experimental song, but it's definitely not a David Bowie song that I would want to listen to again. It is definitely one of those songs where you have to listen to it again, which is probably something I need to do. I just thought the song was just all over the place and... I'm still confused. I, 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 I really don't know anymore. But anyway, let's just move on to track eight, New York's In Love. Here it is. That was track 8, New York's In Love, 
and uh, <laughs> I mean, I really did like the production, but I didn't really find the track overall to be particularly memorable. And because I didn't think the song was memorable, I thought the instrumental towards the end dragged on longer than it needed to. This song does seem to be a love letter to New York. New York's in love, the city grew wings in the back of night, the clouds are stuck like candy floss. She sees the rich trash having all the fun. Makes me wonder where they get their energy from. The city's all clean and waiting. I don't mean to wait too long. But this joint can't get much higher. New York's in love with her big green eyes and her long blonde hair. Overlords have had their day. We can dance and we can see the singles swing. Everybody's waiting for the go-go boys. It's like a night on the town in New York City, wandering the streets and the clubs and the bars of New York and seeing the people dance and swing and waiting for the go-go boys and just... New York's in flames and New York's in love. It's a very feel-good song. But he does say towards the end of the song, ugly on the east side. What happens on the east side? <laughs> I just want to go back to Shining Star for a second because it says here that David wanted Shining Star to be a single from the album, but EMI had the final say and did not release the song as a single. Thank God. <laughs> David called New York's In Love a sarcastic song about the vanity of big cities. So I guess it's not really a love letter to New York. It's more so just a comedic take on the brats of New York, the rich snobs of New York. She sees the rich trash having all the fun. So I guess it's a very superficial look at New York. I've never been to New York. I know, so sad, but definitely within the next few years. I have to, I'm sick of waiting, I have to go to New York. I also found his vocals on this track to be interesting. I will say there does seem to be something quite experimental about this album production-wise, and just the flow of the album, even his singing. He's definitely trying new things with this album. But anyway, let's move on to track 9, 87, and Cry. <sighs> track 9, 87, and Cry. And once again, just like quite a few of the other songs, I liked the production. I was definitely rocking out to the production. His vocals are quite... Um, what's the word? He's using a lot of falsetto on this album, a lot of... How do I do it? It's kind of like... <laughs> wow! That... Okay, I need to find an example. <laughs> he kind of goes like... Yeah, it kind of sounds like a drunk, sassy gay guy. <laughs> it's like, we're yeah, like, oh, yeah. Mm. He just does these interesting, quirky things with his voice on this album. It's just a $1 secret, a lover's secrets in the UK, torn apart in the UK, 
in the dribble of May Day, 87 and cry, and there's nothing inside. And only you rock it on through the sky. Well, it could be done without dogs. When days were the days, boys, when the blue ties were the big guys, Fred is dressing down for the enemy. I have absolutely no idea what he's singing about. <laughs> David originally wrote the song 87 and Cry as a statement about Margaret Thatcher, oh, who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time. The song referred to the distinction between the authoritarian government and the citizens, the dogs. The diamond dogs, no. And David admitted that the lyrics verged on the surreal, describing people eating the energies of others to get to what they wanted. Well, that's David Bowie for you. <laughs> Even after reading that, I still have no idea what he's singing about. <laughs> I really don't have much to say about this track. It's not one of my favorites on the album, and it's not one of the highlights, in my opinion. I... I wouldn't listen to it again, really. But anyway, let's move on to track 11, the song that was removed from the album because David disliked it too dizzy. So let's check it out. And that was track 10, Too Dizzy. And I just, I don't know, I just thought the track itself was quite boring to listen to. And it's just kind of, what's the best word to use? It's just flat, I guess. It's just there. Like, nothing happens in the song, really. It's just, it kind of just sounds like a filler track. And... To me, it was just quite boring to listen to. The song was written as a tribute to the 1950s. David said a real 50s subject matter was either love or jealousy, so I thought I'd stick with jealousy because it's a lot more interesting. David at the time called the song a throwaway and seemed surprised that he included it on the album. The song has been deleted from subsequent reissues of Never Let Me Down. I didn't even listen to the whole song, unfortunately. It was kind of like watching paint dry. It was just painfully boring to listen to. But anyway, we have come to the end of the album, track 10, Bang Bang. <laughs> And that was the final track, Bang Bang, and 
I mean, this was a fun song to listen to. I had fun listening to it, but it's nothing really to write home about, unfortunately, and it doesn't really warrant multiple listens. I also find his vocals, I don't know, there's something about his vocals on this album I'm not enjoying. Young girls know what they after. Young girls don't kiss me goodbye. Rockets shooting up into space. Buildings, they rise to the skies. Bang, bang, I got mine. Bang, bang, reach for the sky. I keep a good friend on videotape. He'll drive his sports car until it's too late. Now, it looks like this is a cover of the Iggy Pop song, Bang, Bang. Now, as to why David covered this song, he said, Iggy's done so many good songs that people never get to hear. I think it's one of his best songs, Bang Bang, and it hasn't been heard, and now it might be. I definitely do want to go on my Iggy Pop discography journey sometime next year or in a couple years. I don't know when, but David Bowie has really opened my eyes to Iggy Pop, and thanks to David Bowie, I'm very much intrigued by Iggy Pop now. So that was all 11 tracks of Never Let Me Down by David Bowie. I'm gonna say it. This album did let me down. <laughs> I do like the first half of the album, but then it just gradually gets worse. <laughs> it's a very experimental album. It almost sounds like an album that we were never meant to hear. It just sounds like David was playing around in the studio, trying different things, just experimenting. This just doesn't sound like an album that we should have heard. The album almost sounds unfinished, and I liked the production most of the time. I had fun rocking out to quite a few of these songs. I liked the, of course, guitar. I liked the harmonica. I think there was a saxophone at one point. So I enjoyed jamming out to the overall production of the album. I did kind of like the lyrics. I mean, these lyrics are typical David Bowie. Very cryptic. And... I don't think this album has his best lyrics. I didn't find the stories on this album to be as interesting and engaging as a lot of his other albums. I do like the social commentary aspect in some of these songs, like tracks one and two. It's a very bizarre album, even for David Bowie standards. And his vocals, his vocals were... I don't know what he was trying to do at times, but... I did like his vocals at times during the duration of this album, but there were other times where he was just doing bizarre, strange things, falsetto, and these quirks, and I can't really explain it, but I don't really like what he was doing with his voice a lot of the time. It is a sloppy album. It's kind of just all over the place. I do think the most intriguing song on the album is track six, Glass Spider. I just think some of these songs are quite boring to listen to, in particular the songs on the second half of the album. Not very memorable, not a lot of replay value, unfortunately. I don't really know what he was trying to do with this album, but like I said already, this album, for me anyway, is uncooked, and it's like the beginning stages of a good album. Like, this was the lead-up to something better. Like, he was experimenting with this new sound, trying to come up with something, but instead, we just got this. There is something quite flamboyant about this album when it comes to David's energy and his singing. I can see why a lot of people disliked this album and call it one of his weakest. Someone said here that... The album is a mix of commercial and experimental sounds, which, yes, I do agree with that because there are songs on here that do sound quite commercial, like track four, Never Let Me Down, and then there are other tracks like, I mean, there's so many, Glass Spider, Shiny Star, what have you, that are just quite experimental to listen to. I do like that David was experimenting and trying new things with this album, but... To me, this album is just uncooked. So what did you guys think of the album, and what are your impressions of it? I don't know, it's just for me anyway. I just... 
I didn't find anything particularly interesting about this album. Nothing really stood out to me, and I did like some of the songs, but it's just all kind of a blur to me. But anyway, in my next David Bowie video, we will move on to his next solo album, Six Years Later. Didn't release an album for six years after this album, and I don't blame him, because this album was a mess. It was. <laughs> But I will be listening to a Black Tie White Noise from 1993. Now, some of you pointed out to me that he put out an album called Tin Machine. Tin Machine is the debut album by American rock band Tin Machine, which includes David Bowie. I will be skipping over that album for now, but perhaps down the line, if you guys really want me to, I will check out this album. And officially, I think that's all I have to say on Never Let Me Down. I'm sure there are other things I wanted to say, but I think that's it. So thanks for watching, guys. You can find me on Instagram, you can find my Twitter, you can message me, you can say, hey, how are you? And I'll see you next time. Take care.